good morning. Good to see all of you. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, turn in your Bible to the book of James, chapter 1. James chapter 1, we continue our study of the book of James, calling it Real Faith. And again, this is what James wants these Christians then, to whom he wrote, as well as Christians today, to have and to pursue is a real faith. Uh, We're going to finish James chapter 1 this morning, but I want to begin our reading at verse 19 and read to the end of the chapter. Uh, That way we get a, a flavor of where we were a couple of weeks ago, and then we can press forward into... Uh, our text today. James 1, beginning in verse 19. Hear now the word of the true and living God. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans, and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let us pray. Father God, we we desire to be doers. And so, as we hear your word this morning, May it sink down deep into our hearts, that it may transform us so that we might indeed put your word into practice. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I've heard it often, we we talked about it a couple of weeks ago when we broached this particular part of the epistle of James. Uh, Several years ago, I happened to be just channel surfing, and and the station landed on uh, TBN, uh, the the religious, the the Christian broadcasting network. And uh, Dr., the late now, Dr. Frederick Casey Price, was on his weekly television program. And it it just so happened to land on uh, the moment in that sermon that he was giving where Dr. Price said, religion is an abomination. And I remember yelling at the TV, (laughs) because I, I wonder if this theologian, and I use that term loosely for televangelists, I wonder if he's even read James chapter 1. Because Christianity is a religion. And in fact, to be a Christian simply is to put your religion on display. Now, admittedly, religion can be bad. Scripture even talks about uh, worship of angels, the word that Paul uses in Colossians 2 and verse 18 to talk about r- worship of angels is the same word that's used here for religion in James 1, 27. There's also self-made religion, again in Colossians 2, this time verse 
23. But just because religion can be perverted does not mean that religion should be completely abandoned. To the contrary, as we see in our text this morning, Scripture speaks of religion that is pure and undefiled, which is before God. And um, instead of abandoning the, the word religion or the idea of religion, Christians today ought to be working to recapture the essence of what is true, pure, undefiled religion before God. James has been moving his readers along through this section to this point. The focus has been on the word of truth, the implanted word there in verse 21, the perfect law, even the law of liberty in verse 25. And so the call to these Christians then, again, is not to be merely a hearer of the word only, but to do what it says, to put it into practice. And James gets very practical. And he puts this in very tangible terms. Several actions are highlighted in this section, which is also an echo of what our Lord, James's half-brother, Jesus, talked about. That it would be foolish to take the words of Jesus and not put them into practice. That would be like a person who builds a house upon sand. And so James, again, he is at pains to emphasize we need to put the word into practice. Verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Decept James is very much concerned about Christians being deceived and also deceiving themselves. We see there, verse 22, deceiving yourselves. And then uh, in verse 26, you, you can, he, a person can deceive their own heart, which is just self-deception as well. But as we move into verse 23, we left off verse 22 a couple of weeks ago. Verse 23, James uses an illustration here. And it is intended to illustrate his point through an absurd image. He talks about a, a person who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Now, uh, many of you, no doubt, got up this morning, you got ready for church, and one thing you probably did was you spent a little bit of time in front of the mirror doing whatever it is you got to do to make yourself look the way you do this morning. Right? That's a, very, that's a normal thing, right? People do this on a day-by-day -day basis, right? Just a quick look in the mirror, or maybe a rather prolonged look in the mirror, depending upon uh, your uh, particular uh, need that morning. <laughs> and James says, a person who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, they look at themselves in the mirror, and then verse 24, he looks at himself, goes away, and at once forget, forgets what he looks like. That's, that's an absurd idea, right? I mean, this morning, imagine, once you got all fixed up, however it was, and you turned to walk away, and you went, wait a minute, what do I look like again? Right? You know what you look like. And again, just it, how absurd. The, the face that you just saw a moment ago, whew, forgotten. That's what it's like when you hear the word, only, and you don't do what it says. That's James's point. You look into the perfect law. You see who you are to be like. You are to be like Christ. Your moral defects, your moral shortcomings, your character flaws, your sin, is exposed by the mirror of God's Word. And as soon as the hearing is over, you're like, all right, on to the next thing. And, and even though these things have been exposed, right? Just like if you're looking at your face in the mirror and, you know, you brushed your teeth this morning, you got a little bit of toothpaste right here, right? And you just left it there. Your hair's all askew. You didn't, you know, fix it up. And you, you saw all that and you went away and you're like, eh, okay, whatever. I'm on my merry way, right? 
And it gets even more absurd because, I mean, if we tra trace this illustration through, now you're walking up to people and they're like, uh, you, you got a little, and you're like, no, 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 I'm good. I would have seen it, right? And you did, but you forgot. God's Word is that mirror that we look into. And, and we are supposed to experience conviction because there's that blemish. There's, there's, that, there's that stain that's on the cheek or on the forehead, right? And I can't just leave that there. I've got to, with the blood of Christ, apply it to my life, apply the blood to my life to have that sin washed away, to allow the Holy Spirit to change and shape and, and deepen me in my sanctification, to do the difficult work of repentance, to turn away from that sin and to Follow hard after Jesus. A Christian who forgets to look like Christ. How absurd! But that's, that's James's point. And so, you have a, another beatitude here in verse 25. This is, this is what we should strive for. What we should aim for. The one who looks into the perfect law. The law of liberty. Now, uh, James is going to talk about the law of liberty again in chapter 2 and verse 12. He's going to talk about the whole law in verse 10, the royal law in verse 8. And the way that he uses these phrases and the terminology indicates that what he has in mind is the Hebrew Bible, the, the law that was given by God. In 2 verse 8, the royal law is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Where did that come from? Leviticus. Uh, in verse uh, 10, the whole law, he talks about in verse 11, don't commit adultery, don't murder. Where'd those come from? The, the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Okay. So the way he talks here about the perfect law and the law of liberty is, well, it, it's God's law. And as Christians, we are to take the good holy spiritual law that God has given us and seek to apply it in every area of our life. Now, you of course know that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. So when it comes to all the ceremonial laws, everything, the sacrificial laws, Christ has fulfilled that. So we don't, that's why we don't offer bulls and goats and, and grain and all that stuff. It's because Christ is the fulfillment of that one time for all time, as the writer of Hebrews says. Furthermore, Christ has fulfilled the law in every aspect for us in the moral sense. He lived the sinless life you and I could never live. So what is it that James is after here? He's talking again to Christians who are seeking to follow Christ. And what that means is, again, we, we seek to follow the law as it is interpreted or worked through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Christ. It's akin to what um, Paul talks about. You know, Paul talks about, uh, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then he goes on in verse, this is Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Verse 10 he says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk therein. And that is what James is after. Uh, the, the same thing that Paul is. The good works that we are to walk in, that God prepared beforehand in advance. What are those good works? Just what He's given us in the law. Now, can we keep the law perfectly? James is going to address this. No. If you fall short in just one area, you're guilty of the whole law. That's where we live. When we come up short, and we do, and we will, that is when we look to Christ. That is when we look to His blood that was shed on the cross that forgives us of all of our sin. That is when we re uh, renew our devotion and our dedication to Him. That's when we repent and we turn away from that sin and we seek the help that comes from God's Holy Spirit to continue in the Christian walk. The perfect law, the law of liberty, 
is about, the key word there in verse 25 is perseverance. You persevere. Do you keep it perfectly? No. It's about perseverance. We can never keep it perfectly. That's why we need Jesus. But we persevere in it. We're not hearers only who forget, but a doer who acts. Now notice, and here's the key difference, right? There's a a world of difference between reading the end of verse 25 as he will be blessed for his doing, which is not what James says, versus he will be blessed in his doing. You hear the difference? James is not saying that you work in order to get into God's good grace. You keep the law and and you're blessed for that. That God is somehow blessing you because you have kept the law. That's that's the, the hamster wheel of works. No, what James is after is there's a blessing for those uh, that you will be blessed in your doing. That as you are doing those things, again, out of gratitude to God because of what He's done in Christ on your behalf, as you persevere in that, there is blessing attached in that. In your doing. In the action of following after Christ. <clears throat> again, a world of difference between blessed for and blessed in. And James is after you're blessed in the doing. <clears throat> Which brings us uh, to uh, verses 26 and 27. And, and there's, there's our key word, right? Religious. Uh, there in verse 26, if anyone thinks he is religious. Uh, religion is used there at the end of verse 26, also at the beginning of verse 27. Which, again, just goes to show that, that while, yes, it is about a relationship with Christ, I'm not discounting that at all. It's also a religion. And, again, unfortunately, that, that word has gotten a bad rap in, in recent years. But James, again, this is all part of the flow of the discussion that he's having about doers of the Word. Those who seek uh, to follow Christ, which just is part of our sanctification. It echoes back to verse 21. Putting away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Receiving with meekness the implanted Word. This is part of the Christian religion. But again, James gets intensely practical again here in verse 26 where he says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives himself. Ooh. Uh, well, um, got me, right? The, the, the tongue, the way we use our mouths is something that James will bring up more than once throughout this epistle. We've seen it already. We're going to see it again in in chapter 3 and also in chapter 4. James is uh, deeply concerned about the things that we say. And in back of what James is saying here is no doubt what his brother, his half-brother Jesus had said. How do you know what's in a person's heart? What comes out of the mouth is a reflection of the heart. It is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's Jesus. And so if your heart, if you've got a heart full of darkness, a heart full of gravel, guess what's going to come out of your mouth? But if God truly is at work in your life, and God has given you this new heart, and God, through the blood of Christ, has forgiven us of our sins, and we are seeking to follow after Jesus, what, what is it that's going to come out of our mouths in that instance, right? And so, uh, bridle the tongue. Uh, the word there for bridle, that it, it's, a, it's a metaphorical use. It was a, a, a word that would be used for what you put in a horse's mouth in order to guide them and to control the horse, right? That's the idea of the bridle here. And so, again, James is at pains here. What is it that's coming out of your mouth? 
there are, of course, a number of things that the Christian is to avoid. Lying. Lying. Yeah, we, we are to be people who speak honest words. Truthful words. Uh, profanity. Yeah, that, that ought not to come out of our mouths, brothers and sisters. But rather those things that are encouraging and building up and edifying others. Um, curses, right? All these things that are related to the mouth. What is it that's... And, and by the way, bridling your tongue, we're going to see this when we get to chapter 3, no one can tame the tongue. You need God's help if you're going to overcome these things. If you are not bridling your tongue, you think you're religious, but you're not bridling your tongue, you're, you're deceiving your heart. You, you are lying to yourself. This person's religion is worthless. Wow. That's pretty steep right there, right? The word there for worthless, by the way, is, is used, um, it's used in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And what's interesting is that some of the context that this word is used, it comes up in discussions about idols. Idols are worthless things. These false gods are worthless things. So it's very, very interesting that James leans into that in this context of religion to talk about, again, a very practical thing about how do you use your mouth. If you think you're religious, but you're, the, what's, what's reflected by your mouth indicates otherwise, uh, you're in, involved in idolatry, essentially. And the idol that you have set up, again, if it's self-deception, that means this is self-deification. The self has become God. That kind of religion is worthless. It is uh, empty. It is void of any kind of power. Right? And in fact, uh, the one who thinks he's religious, uh, they have uh, an appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. The importance of taming our tongues, I believe, brothers and sisters, is seen here. I think there may be some Christians today who wreck their religion by failing to bridle their tongue. Far too often, a Christian's speech mimics the world's rather than Christ's speech. How many Christians show up Sunday morning and sing praise to God only to revert back to sailor speak Tuesday afternoon. Well, as James says, my brothers, these things ought not be so. And so we are exhorted here, clean up our mouths, lest our religion be worthless. James goes on here in verse 27 to talk about again religion that is Pure and undefiled. These are, these are words that were used to talk about gems, precious stones. <clears throat> and uh, pure would have to do with, uh, say, a, uh, a precious stone that would come from the ground. Well, uh, in order for it to be pure, you've got to clean, clean off all the impurity from it, right? Whatever, uh, whatever dirt, whatever soil might be on it, um, whatever blemishes might be there, it's, it's been cleaned up and it's pure. We came from the dirt, the dust, the soil, the sludge of sin. And you think of the power that God exerted to pull us out of that and through the blood of Jesus to wash us pure of all of our sin. And now we are pure. A precious gem in the house of God. We're also uh, undefiled. Again, this, this is to be free from any deformity, any defect. And again, the, the same thing applies here where God reached down into this world and pulled out. And, and we, we had blemishes all over us because of sin. And God, through the blood of Christ, has 
washed all those away, and now we are undefiled in Christ Jesus. And now, again, with religion, we are seeking to put that on display. We didn't earn it. We didn't work our way into it. But now, again, out of gratitude to God, we seek to act in a certain way in the world. That's the Christian religion, the Christian faith. We do this before God the Father. Number one, that's, that's who God is. He is our Father. We are His children. And we do this before. before that's presence language. Um, it is, since we are in His presence, this is the kind of behavior that is acceptable to Him. And in fact, your translation may talk about it is acceptable to God. There is a certain way of living that is acceptable to God, which means also that there is a kind of living that is unacceptable to Him. Here, James again is after the kind of uh, practice that is acceptable to God. And he has a couple different things in view. First, pure religion consists in the exercise of active benevolence in a world of suffering. What kind of suffering? Well, notice he emphasizes here at the end of verse 27, orphans and widows. Orphans would be those children who are bereft of parents. Widows are those who have been bereft of their spouse. These are those, again, talk about a world of suffering. They are suffering because of the loss of those who are nearest and dearest to them. And it's in this world of suffering that we are to exercise in, engage in, active benevolence. Good works, specifically toward orphans and widows in their affliction. In other words, while they're hurting. As Jesus said, we are to be merciful even as our Father is merciful. I don't think it's an accident that James talks specifically about God the Father here. This seems to be an echo of Jesus. Be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Now the law... Again, since he talked about the perfect law, the law of liberty. If you go back into the law, the Israelites had a number of instructions about how they were to reap when the harvest time came. And one of the things that they were told, you don't reap the edges of the field. You don't go back if you left a sheaf out in the field. And um, when you beat the, the trees to get the olives from them, and if you did that, you come back later, and, and you realize, oh, I, there's some olives left on there. You don't go back and do it again. And the reason for that, according to Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, and also Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 21, you do that for the poor, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. That's how they're taken care of, is through uh, what is left over, what was left out, right? And so God, He's always been concerned about the weakest. He's always been, He always cares about those who have been, are on the edges of society, who may themselves be overlooked. And this is His way of seeing to it that they are cared for. And the Israelites, again, they knew this. When they neglected to care for the fatherless and for the widows, that was usually when judgment came. And those were things that the prophets would specifically point out to them. You can see Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 as examples of when the people weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And, said, and God says, judgment's coming because of that. You didn't take care of the weakest among you. Under the Christian dispensation, this hasn't gone away. It's not like, well, you know, Jesus came and, well, to circle back to kind of where we started, as long as you have enough faith, God is going to give you a great big bank account and a great big house and a Rolls Royce in your driveway and all that, right? What you'll find with the televangelists. No, what, what you, with, when Christ came, He said, you're always going to have the poor among you. 
There are still the orphans and the widows. And so James is reminding his brothers, and he's reminding us, this stuff is still important. And so the, the widows and the orphans among you, you are to visit them. And again, that's another key term. James is he's a master of the Old Testament. He, his, he writes as one whose life is saturated with it. And this is something we talked about in Bible class too. Visitation, that echoes back to the Exodus. When God visited His people in their affliction in Egypt. And He, he acted, He did something about that. In a similar way, as Christians who seek to be merciful, even as our Father is merciful, we seek to visit the orphans in the, the widows in their affliction as well. <clears throat> so a couple of, of questions, and these, these come to us from uh, Adam Clark in his uh, commentary. He says, this is the religion of Christ, a religion that does not prove itself by works of charity and mercy is not of God. Reader, what religion do you have? Have you ever, has, has your religion ever led you to cellars and houses to find out about the affliction and the distress of others? Have you ever fed, clothed, and visited a destitute representative of Christ? Again, this is what James is calling us to. To support the weakest among us. And then James goes one step further. You're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But then also, the greatest commandment, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does that look like? You need to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does it look like to love God with everything you've got? Keep yourself unstained from the world. It is from this love that a certain lifestyle, a certain habitual practice flows from that love. And so pure religion consists of the maintenance of personal purity in a world of sin. And we are. We are surrounded by sin. We're reminded of it on a daily basis, maybe perhaps even an hourly basis. There's so much sin, so much evil in the world. And the world, James is going to talk about in chapter 4, if you are a friend of the world, you are at enmity with God. You, you can't We'll have it both ways. Where on the one hand you're clinging to the world and on the other hand you're clinging to God. No one can serve two masters. Either you will love the one and despise the other, you'll be devoted to the, other, to the one and hate the other. And so keep oneself unstained from the world. To keep here is it's a military term. Uh, it, it's a, a term that would be used in other contexts to talk about a a prisoner who was kept under guard by soldiers. Kind of like Paul, right? When he was in custody, there would be guards who would keep him. And so James is calling these Christians, you need to fortify yourself and be watchful for the pollutants of the world. Those are very real. They can creep in. And, and the way this is written, it's as if James is saying, keep on keeping on when it comes to being free from stains from the world. This is our habitual practice, to be free from those pollutants. <clears throat> and it's interesting, unstained, again, another interesting term. Can you imagine if I was up here, and like I had like a giant stain on my shirt, right? And I'm up here just like just preaching away, with this giant stain on my shirt. And you're looking at that and you're like, in the world, right? Like, man, it, doesn't he know that it's stained, right? Why is he wearing that shirt? And just all kinds of questions come into your mind, right? That would probably distract you from the things that we're talking about. And I know, you know, uh, 
It's not that, it's not that my whole outfit is, is dirty, right? There's that stain on that one garment. And, and I think a similar thing can happen to us as Christians, right? We were like, well, look, you know, my, it's not my whole life that's a mess, but there's that one stain that it just, it's there. Even the smallest stains, brothers and sisters, need to be dealt with. Jude, which was James's brother, by the way, he talks about hating even the garment that is stained. And so to keep oneself unstained from the world, this fallen world, again, there is so much in it that seeks to stain us. We need to set up this military guard around our hearts. Keeping our hearts, according to the Word of God, to live in this world an otherworldly life. This is the kind of religion that is pure in the eyes of God. James, again, he, he wants, he's at pains for these Christians to avoid self-deception, to avoid being deceived by the evil one, to be deceived by the world, to avoid these things, and instead to practice pure and undefiled religion before God that is acceptable to Him. As we're going to see when we get deeper into chapter 2, there, there were apparently some Christians, I don't know that all of them were, but there were some Christians who thought, you know what, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do, right? I've... Uh, said a prayer, walked an aisle, shook a hand, was baptized, what have you. And now I'm good. Right? I, I, I've, I, I've, I've checked whatever box I need to check. And James says, uh, actually, you need, you need to, there's a practice that goes along with the true Christian religion. James is going to reach the pinnacle of this, this discussion at, at the end of chapter 2. He's going to say, faith without works is dead. Here he's, he's laying the groundwork. He's laying the foundation. Worthless religion is workless religion. A, a, a religion that does not have the good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. That is worthless. But, Religion that seeks to put into action the Word of God, to be a doer of the Word. That seeks to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. That seeks to bridle the tongue. That seeks to visit the orphans, the widows in their affliction. And that seeks to keep oneself unstained from the world. Well, that, that is pure, undefiled, and acceptable to God. Let's come with this to prayer. Father, we pray that you would fortify our hearts and our minds. That we would seek to fill up our hearts and our minds with your word, even with your law. And that we would seek to put into practice the things that we have heard. Help us, Father, by your Holy Spirit within us to do that to be the kind of people that you would have us to be. We're grateful for James, for the book that he wrote. Grateful for your word that you have seen to it that it is preserved across time and space all the way to today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.